Today we're going to consider a very important problem, natural convection. Let's consider a very important problem. Let's take a pizza. It's hot. We just removed it from the oven. We set it down on the counter. Now we're setting an environment uh, that's relatively cool. So the air is cool around the pizza. And the air very close to the pizza is going to heat up. And as it heats up, it's going to become lighter. And it's going to tend to float. And it's going to drift upwards. As the air above the pizza drifts upwards, it's going to pull new cool fluid in from around it. So from all, all sides, cool air is going to be pulled in and warm air is going to float up. And so this is a situation called natural convection because it's simply the density difference, the fact that the air is lighter when it's hot, it tends to float up, which is driving the fluid motion. Uh, without gravity, there would be no fluid motion. We're not blowing on this pizza as in what we would call force convection. So we're just allowing uh, nature to do its own thing and uh, cause the airflow around the pizza to cool it off. And so we'd like a way to understand and be able to predict uh, what happens. And we can do this from our basic equations. Let's return to our basic formulation. So we return to our trusty conservation of mass, momentum, and energy for an incompressible flow in a Newtonian fluid. Uh, and as we've done, we're going to ignore viscous dissipation in the energy equation. So we have our usual terms that we've discussed uh, many times throughout this course. Now, when we talked about force convection, we talked about a one-way coupling. We essentially solved our momentum and mass problem first that gave us the velocity field. We then took that velocity field and we stuffed that into our energy equation because if there was a fluid velocity that could carry energy or heat around our domain. But we didn't really consider the back coupling, uh, which we are going to now. So the, the coupling becomes in the gravitational term. So if the fluid heats up and gets hot, that affects the fluid's density and it's those density difference being acted upon by gravity that cause the fluid motion. So in force convection, we have a one-way coupling. In natural convection, we have a two-way coupling. So the density difference drives the flow. The flow drives the temperature field. The temperature field drives the density difference. So we have this kind of feedback uh, going on there. And so just as we did with uh, force convection, we're not actually going to use these equations to really solve anything, but we're going to use these equations to sort of guide our thinking and our dimensional analysis to tell us what the important terms are and how we might think about the problem in terms of what the important parameters are. So let's make the problem dimensionless. Before we can proceed with the uh, dimensional analysis, though, we need a model for the fluid density. The simplest thing we can do is say that the density is simply linear with temperature. So we'll have some nominal value, rho infinity the density at our sort of nominal temperature, T infinity. And we'll take this factor 1 minus beta, which we'll call the volumetric expansion coefficient, times the temperature difference. So when the, our temperature of the fluid is T infinity, this is 0. And the density is simply that of our kind of nominal density value. And as we increase the temperature, we decrease the density. So this is the simplest model. And it turns out that for a gas, that this volumetric expansion coefficient is simply 1 over the temperature, where the temperature would have to be measured in Kelvin. Uh, for a liquid uh, or a fluid such as water, we would just simply look this value up uh, in a book. Um, now, th the other thing is now we have uh, this complicated thing. So if you remember all of our terms, like in our momentum equation, we have terms that look like this, where we have the density multiplied by the acceleration, dv dt, again, the material derivative of the velocity. And if this density depends on temperature, now we even have something that's kind of more complicated. And so a common approximation is the following. And it's called, let me make sure I can spell this right, the Boussinesque approximation. And it's as followed. And this could be derived a little bit more formally than I've done. I'm just simply stating it. But the Boussinesque approximation does the following. It simply uses the density which multiplies our time derivatives of velocity and temperature, it just simply uses the nominal value rho infinity. It then takes the constant density rho infinity times 1, which comes in our, our density function, and kind of lumps that with the pressure, plus the hydrostatic piece, and kind of pulls that apart. And then uh, leaves this little piece here, which now depends upon the temperature of the fluid. So the, the nominal density times our volumetric expansion times the temperature difference from ambient times our gravity vector, this is what gives us a force or a body force. And so this is an approximation uh, mainly because we're not accounting for the change in density uh, with temperature that occurs in front of these terms. But 
uh, it's still a, a pretty good approximation and uh, can be shown to be uh, fairly accurate if you sort of work out all the details. But I'm not going to work out the details. I'm just going to use the equation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to proceed with our dimensional analysis now. And we're going to proceed exactly as we did uh, in the previous example on forced convection. So again, I'm going to define a set of dimensionless variables such as my coordinate divided by some link scale that I'm not going to specify yet, so I'll just call it L. My dimensionless y variable I'll also go by L. My dimensionless z variable that will also be scaled by L. And we're going to use all the same uh, scalings that we did before. So I'll just write those out and you can look back at the force convection uh, video where we maybe did this a little more slowly. And so we make the following substitutions. We define our new dimensionless variables which are defined in red with twiddles above them. And we have to remember that when we take all our derivatives, such as the gradient operator, when we make those dimensionless, we also pick, factor, pick up factors of the length. Uh, so we simply plug all of these in and we proceed exactly as we did before. I'm going to sort of skip over the detail and just sort of write the final result. Our dimensionless conservation of mass looks exactly as we had before. And so when we carry out our, dimension, our non dimensionalization, we get the exact same thing that we had before. So the same set of equations for conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. We have the same parameters, the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number, but we pick up this new thing. And this new thing is this new term that sits out in front of our dimensionless temperature. And again, as in the previous uh, video, I've dropped the twiddle notation. I'm just using red to highlight my dimensionless variables. So I have this new parameter which shows up, which is given as the volumetric expansion times gravity times t hot minus t infinity times our length scale, uh, the size of our object divided by u naught squared. But we have to realize in this problem of natural convection, we're talking about setting a pizza uh, out on the counter in, a, in nominally still air, at least before we set the pizza there, that there's no u naught, or there's no natural u naught. There's no velocity that we're uh, blowing over the object. We haven't set a fan to be at one meter per second blowing air over our hot object. So the u naught is coming from the physics of the problems itself. So we're allowed to sort of choose it as we did in sort of previous problems. Uh, where there was no natural scale, we're allowed to pick whatever we want. So let's pick u naught squared to equal the volumetric expansion times gravity times our temperature difference, our hot object to our ambient temperature of the environment times L. And when we set that, that's magically going to set this parameter out here equal to 1. And what that's going to do is it's going to change now what our interpretation maybe is of the Reynolds number. So let's work that out. So our scaling says that the velocity squared ought to be proportional to this, or scale with this quantity here. And our Reynolds number is defined as, again, as density, velocity, length, divided by viscosity. So I take my velocity scale, I plug it in the Reynolds number. For convenience, I'll just square it so I can directly substitute in velocity squared. And I get this new quantity. Uh, this new quantity is density squared times the volumetric expansion, gravity, temperature difference, length cubed, divided by viscosity squared. Uh, this dimensionless number is known as the Grasshoff number. And so if we go back and we look at our conservation of uh, momentum, if we use this definition of u naught squared, then our Reynolds number here becomes 1 divided by the square root of the Grasshoff number. And that number also shows up in there. So pretty cool, we pick up a new dimensionless number. And if we look at that number, we see it depends upon uh, the density of the fluid, which again here, this would just be the nominal density. Uh, fluid property, fluid property, gravity, temperature difference, size of the object. And if we look back at our equations, we would now see that if we did the same type of analysis that we did before, and we said, well, what's the total heat transfer leaving our pizza that our average Nusselt number would now be written as a function of two dimensionless parameters, the Grasshoff number and the Prandtl number. And so the situation is exactly as we have with force convection, except we use a set of different uh, dimensionless numbers. So in force convection, we say that the average Nusselt number can only be a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. In natural convection, we say the average Nusselt number can only be a function of the Grasshoff number and the Prandtl number. Uh, it's pretty common to find correlations in textbooks that will use the Rayleigh number instead of the Grasshoff number, but the Rayleigh number is just defined as the Grasshoff number times the Prandtl number.
Now it's a little bit silly to have these numbers that are products of numbers and give them new names, but hey, this is the world we live in. It's not the one that I invented. Uh, so you'll often find, uh, just as we saw with force convection, we can find correlations which will relate Reynolds number to Prandtl number for particular geometries. One can find the same thing for natural convection. So uh, we can have the same problem if we can have a hot cylinder. We can have cold fluid that will drive fluid motion around that, and we might want to know how what's the rate of heat transfer from this hot object to the cold fluid. And just as before, we can look up those uh, type of correlations in a textbook. Okay, so if we turn to my uh, trusty heat transfer book, so the one I used uh, when I was an undergraduate, um, one that we can still uh, get copies of, only a slightly newer edition. And we look in the chapter on what they call free convection, which is the same thing as natural convection. You'll find it full of correlations. So here's just an example, the long horizontal cylinder. Uh, so the Nusselt number, which again is the convection coefficient HD over K, so this is the average one. They're saying here can be uh, fit by data, which is some constant times the Rayleigh number to some power n. And if we look on the next page, uh, there's just simply a table. So for different Rayleigh numbers, uh, here C and N that go into the formula. And just as an alternate one, here's somebody else's fit to data. So they're writing it rather than as a simple function, uh, kind of a more complicated law where they've got the Prandtl number and the Rayleigh number in there. Uh, but again, both of these are just fits to data. Uh, they're, 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 the original reference is here, so here it was 20. Uh, I think on the other one it was another reference, 21. If we look those up in the back, we'll see that both of those papers were in about 1975, so this is uh, not exactly new stuff. And so again, these, um, these correlations just simply come from data. So people measure uh, the heat transfer performance and then correlate the Nusselt number versus the known dimensionless parameters, Rayleigh number and Prandtl number. And that's kind of all there is to it. Let's consider one last case. This will be mixed convection where effects of both forced and free convection may matter. So we're going to have a hot object held at a constant temperature T hot, and it'll, we'll say it's a cylinder with diameter D. It's going to be in a gravitational field. We're going to have a cold fluid with temperature T infinity blowing with a velocity U naught that we know. So we're putting a fan on this object, uh, but it's hot and it's in gravity, so we might also have natural convection. So if we simply follow the kind of analysis that we've done before of dimensions, we'd find out that we have uh, three parameters. The Reynolds number, which is connected with the velocity that we know that we're forcing across the object. The Prandtl number, which is just a property of the fluid. And our new parameter, the Grasshoff number. If we wanted to understand whether this problem here was force convection or natural convection, we'd just have to take the following ratio. So we'd take the ratio of the Grasshoff number to the square of the Reynolds number. And it turns out if that ratio is much, much less than one, so it's a small number, it's Reynolds number dominated by the velocity that we're forcing, so we're in the region of forced convection. If the number is much, much greater than one, we'd be in the regime of natural convection. And so that would mean that even though we're blowing on the object, that that velocity is relatively small compared to the velocity that's set up by the, hot, uh, by the density differences from the hot air around our object. And if it's on the order of one, then they both matter. And in that case, you can actually find, if uh, one looks hard enough, correlations that uh, account for both effects of natural and force convection. Uh, but the nice thing is, is that if we just calculate our dimensionless numbers from the, st the start, the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number, the Grasshoff number, it gives us an indication of which regime we're in, and uh, we can sort of go from there.